My name is Dr. Matthew Phillips. I am a neurologist in Hamilton, New Zealand, working at Waikato Hospital. A um, bit about myself, I guess I grew up in Canada and I trained in Australia and I currently live here in New Zealand for the last near seven years. My view of health has changed drastically over the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, I guess 10 years ago, I never really had a conceptualization of health. I never really thought about it that much because as a clinical um, physician, one has spent, spends most of their time actually trying to treat disease and manage disease uh, or the perception of what is disease. And, you know, as soon as the symptoms uh, or signs and symptoms of the disease are sort of absent, um, the patient is out the door, they go home and it's, it, it never really was about health. I never really trained um, to learn about health. So my conceptualization of it has changed drastically. Now I see health, uh, it, health is of course a very broad thing. Uh, I guess there is um, psychological uh, and mental health. There is emotional health, having good relationships and so on. Uh, there's healthy interactions in the world in general. For example, I think trying to be a good uh, this is aimed at men's health, so trying to be a good man and trying to uh, help other people and make the world a better place. That's a very important aspect of health. If you're not doing that, I would say no matter what all the indices are, uh, you have are showing, you're not truly healthy. Um, but I guess underpinning all of those things uh, and what we usually think of as health is sort of physical and cognitive health. So, uh, you know, because we're off as doctors, we're often treating, you know, uh, all these weird disorders and we're trying to... Um, uh, you know, really, we're, we're trying to uh, uh, aim at this target of, of physical and cognitive health, and that's the core of it. Without that, you can't do all those other things. And the core of that, in my opinion, is optimized mitochondria function. And the mitochondria are all the batteries in all our cells, almost all of our cells in our bodies. And uh, really, if you boil uh, it down to that, um, metabolic health, metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body. Um, at the core of metabolism, in my opinion, really is the mitochondria. And so every single, uh, almost every uh, single uh, strategy I can think of for health aims at restoring mitochondria function and keeping them optimized. And if you do that, um, I think you're gonna do uh, very well in terms of health. And I do define health very differently from fitness. They're not the same thing. So health, I define as optimized mitochondrial function. Fitness, I would say, is more of a, uh, a capacity to uh, be strong or fit, uh, strong or fast or uh, skillful, you know, things, uh, things that are um, uh, abilities, I would say, that you can do that perhaps other people can't do. Uh, but it, fitness, although there is definitely overlap with health, I would say fitness it's quite a different thing there. You know, ultra athletes, for example, are extremely fit individuals, but uh, very uh, few of them, if any, are actually truly healthy. Very good question. Um, so when did I start to see health differently? I guess I always had this uh, sneaking suspicion in my medical school years and training years as a doctor that perhaps there was more to health and what I was being um, instructed uh, with regards to it as sort of the, you know, the absence of symptoms and signs of disease processes. But I guess it never really um, entered my um, awareness or my, my, my conscious uh, mind at, uh, to any significant extent until I, I, I left the medical system. I, I finished all my training and I left the medical system for three years, essentially, um, worked and volunteered we went in and out of the medical system at times, but there were great, great swaths of time where I was not exposed to uh, doctors and, and uh, patients. And it was during that time when I just had time to think about what, what is a truly healthy person. And, you know, it, it gets a little bit philosophical, I think, as well, um, that I, I really started to think outside the box. And I, I don't recall the details of this uh, journey. I, I think I, I must have been looking at YouTube videos a lot and trying to uh, learn about a lots of lots of different things. I remember trying to learn a lot about stem cells and deciding that was not the way. And uh, I sort of uh, 
I guess I came upon these other strategies like fasting and ketogenic diets and this idea of metabolic health. And it seemed to make a lot more sense to me um, than, um, than the other things I had been taught. And then, uh, yeah, I just kept learning and, and gradually this idea that perhaps um, health can be um, quantified because it was difficult to quantify uh, for me for the first few years. I, but I, I wanted to quantify it. I like to quantify things to say, here's some parameters that I can aim at. I need, you need a target to aim at. And I decided that uh, the mitochondria were, were probably the best target. And this involved looking at history with uh, you know, the original debates between uh, Louis Pasteur and Antoine Béchamp a couple hundred years ago in France and, and you know, their varying ideas on uh, disease and health and so on. question that taking the time out uh, changed my entire perspective and, and how I practice, uh, you know, daily with my patients and, and also my view of life and, um, you know, how, what I, the, everything I do in my own life, it all changed with, with that, that single moment. That was prob probably one of the greatest moments of my life when I decided to step out and uh, buy this you know, sort of one-way ticket to Buenos Aires kind of thing. And and um, I think it's almost a necessary step for a, a, certainly a young man or even a middle-aged man, if one hasn't done that before, because um, I, I remember uh, listening to an interview by this uh, older guy named Doug Casey. Some of your viewers will know about Doug Casey. He's an, this uh, older libertarian fellow, and he was doing an interview, and, and he basically said something along the lines of, um, if one is finished high school or university, it's actually, it's not a... Uh, a bad thing to go traveling around the world and 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 see the world. It's actually and it's actually a responsibility and, and almost a necessary thing. And that was a light bulb moment for me. That's when I just went, you know, I mean, I was uh, 30, 37 years old at the time, so I was certainly not out of high school. But it was like, okay, so this is not just, uh, you know, I kind of felt guilty about wanting to take a year or two off to to try and clear my thoughts. But when I heard that, it was like the light bulb went off, and suddenly the guilt was. Uh, abolished and it became a responsibility that I actually had to do that because I was stuck in this system which was almost like the matrix that that movie the matrix that came out with uh, Keanu Reeves in the 90s I, I I realized it was kind of like a matrix where you're you're stuck in this ideology and this dogma all the time and it's really healthy to break free of that and uh, you just have to do it So I'm a clinical neurologist, so I see a lot of patients, uh, but I also do a lot of research, I'd say just as much, uh, if not more, and I do a lot of teaching. So uh, in terms of the clinical work, that's seeing the, uh, I'm a general neurologist, so I see a lot of uh, the standard neurological disorders. I guess I have an interest in, uh, well, I have an interest in many things, but I see a lot of the movement disorders, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. Uh, I see a lot of the degenerative disorders, so motor neuron disease. I see a fair bit of Alzheimer's. Um, I see uh, quite a few patients with uh, glioblastoma multiform, unfortunately. And uh, unfortunately, because it's uh, such a terrible disorder. I mean, most of them are very difficult. I see a lot of undiagnosed neuropathies and uh, myopathies, so muscle disorders and nerve disorders. And um, yeah, strokes, strokes and epilepsy and seizures, tons of those and these uh, very interesting disorders called functional neurological disorders. So that's my clinical work. Research-wise, um, as you know, I've done a lot of work in sort of neurodegeneration and cancer. And um, right now, I've, the last few years have been more neurodegeneration. So I randomized trials on Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but now we're focusing on glioblastoma multiform, which is a very terrible uh, brain cancer. It's, it's basically one of the worst tumors you can get with a very poor prognosis. <clears throat> and we're implementing a very, very intensive fasting ketogenic type protocol to see if we can help these guys to live longer with a higher quality of life. And uh, that's absorbing a lot of my interest. I'm also probably spending even, well, just as much time uh, writing a paper on brain processing, which is over, I'm over a year into, and it's extremely difficult as well. Trying to, trying to think about one's own brain is a very interesting uh, <laughs> thing, but uh, that, that's, that's fun. And uh, yeah, the teaching is basically, I do most of the teaching, certainly at Waikato hospitals, so teaching medical students, junior doctors, neurology registrars, uh, just to, how to be you know, a good clinical neurologist, I guess.
So that's, that is most of my life when I'm not sleeping and eating, but fortunately I don't eat very much. So I have a lot of time. Me the most joy out of all those things. Gosh. If I feel like I've truly helped someone change the trajectory of their disorder, uh, that's got to be the greatest feeling. I mean, just, uh, and that can include publishing the, the, the trials, the studies, you know, which, which often involve a patient who, uh, or patients that, that one did that with. I think that's just great. When you can take something that's just, especially when other people, many other people, other doctors included, thought that, you know, there was no hope and no chance to do anything for this person and, and hope was lost. Restoring hope. I love restoring hope to people and actually not just hope, but having a plan of action and uh, seeing it come to, to some kind of fruition. What patients need are hope and a plan. Hope alone is not enough and a plan alone is not enough. You need both of them. And I find if we do that and, and the outcome is good, uh, I, I would not say it's always good, but if, one, if the outcome is good and very frequently, I think one can achieve that even the, in these terrible disorders, that's probably the best. That's the thing I like the most. Uh, that's a very good uh, question. So my opinion is, uh, yes, I think mitochondria dysfunction, abnormal mitochondria uh, underpins and uh, may well be the main causative factor in the neurodegenerative disorders, cancer, atherosclerosis, and the metabolic syndrome, and basically most of the top 10 disorders that kill uh, people in the West today. Now, um, that is a uh, theory that is not a fact because it's difficult to um, unweave uh, correlation versus causation. We know that mitochondria are damaged in all of these disorders. They're heavily damaged in cancer. They're heavily damaged in Alzheimer's. They're heavily damaged in Parkinson's. They're damaged in atherosclerosis and so on, diabetes, you name it. Uh, however, is that a result of the disorder or are they the cause of the disorder? And I think uh, based on uh, what I've read and uh, what I've seen with patients and, and uh, uh, I guess a lot of it's, uh, you know, there's no direct evidence. It's very hard to find direct, that kind of direct uh, cause and effect evidence. Uh, I, th I think the mitochondria are the main uh, determinants of health. That is to say, if one has healthy mitochondria, the chance of getting cancer is extremely low. The chance of getting Alzheimer's is extremely low. The chance of getting atherosclerosis, heart disease, so heart attacks, strokes, is extremely low. Um, I think uh, the more I do this, the more I think that's the case. And I certainly didn't start out with this research thinking that was the case. I, I just thought, you know, about the ketones and their advantages, their bioenergetic advantages. And I thought about lowering glucose being a good thing and insulin resistance and diabetes. But the deeper I dug, the more I thought about it, getting past those concepts, I, I think mitochondrial dysfunction underlies all of those things. The insulin resistance, the Warburg, you know, the Warburg effect for cancer and um, the, the, the gradual withering and degeneration of neurons in Alzheimer's and even atherosclerotic plaques. I do think mitochondrial dysfunction underlies it all. And uh, I've of course written a paper about it a few months ago and you know, I may be wrong, I may be wrong. I'm open to that possibility, but I, but I, I wouldn't have written a paper on that if I didn't think there was uh, quite a lot of evidence to back it up. To keep your mitochondria healthy, I think uh, that is mostly in one's control. There are always exceptions. There are some people that have uh, these very rare primary mitochondria disorders and so on, but the vast majority of people, the health of your mitochondria and therefore your health, your physical and cognitive health is under your control. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, first of all, it's important to have a reason, I think, to have your mitochondria be kept healthy. And uh, this is about, again, men's health. So for a man, I think what a man must have a reason. The most important thing a man can uh, have is a mission in life, some kind of vision. If one does not have a mission or a vision, something that he truly believes in is worth doing, even more important than his own life, then you're just drifting or you're going to engage in self-destructive behaviors, uh, of which there are so many different ones. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, from what I see, most men 
that I uh, am in touch with, that have been in touch with, do not really have a mission that supersedes all those other things. Uh, the mission really is the number one priority because that is your anchor in life. And it, it's the thing that wakes you up in the, in the morning, makes you feel excited to get on and, and, and get on with your day. So I would say you have to have a reason to have mitochondria health and health in general. Now, assuming you have a mission, you have to carry it out. And then yes, uh, your health is, you know, healthy body, healthy brain. Those are your greatest tools to um, carrying out your mission. And I should say the mission, you know, it should be a very difficult thing. And it, it may be something that uh, you don't even know how you can do it. There's this concept of, uh, oh, I think it was Bob Proctor, uh, A goals, B goals, and C goals. A goals are goals you think you can do and you can do it if you do enough work. B goals are goals you're not sure you can do them, but maybe you can achieve them if you work hard enough and you think hard enough. And C goals are the, are the ones that are like mission type goals. They're impossible. They're castles in the sky. You can't achieve them. Uh, you can't even see the what, how to get there, but you go anyways. And as you go towards those seagulls, that mission, you actually grow along the way. And as you grow, you might just get there. So that's why it's so important. The mission keeps you growing, and it's really important for a guy to do this. So without that, and uh, yeah, I don't know. In my opinion, it's extremely attractive to women too. So you know, as a woman, you don't want to go up the guy who doesn't have a a vision or a mission. In life, you know, he's he's just kind of a, wasting his time if he has, doesn't have that. So after the mission, uh, the best metabolic strategy, bar none, this is my opinion, but, uh, and I practice all these things, um, you know, constantly fasting. Some kind of fasting protocol is number one. Uh, well, number two after the mission. Why is that? Because fasting is where your mitochondria are renewing themselves the best. Now, this can vary. So a young man who's fit, uh, and, you know, and uh, exercises a lot, he may, uh, especially if he's trying to gain muscle, he does not want to do long fasts. You want to do a short intermittent fasting protocol. So fasts that are under uh, intermittent fasting is anything sort of under 48 hours. You probably just want to do, you know, like um, 16 hours a day fast or uh, two huge meals a day fast or something. And you can build absolutely adequate, uh, very good muscle and maintain uh, you know, a high degree of leanness and, and functional strength that way. Uh, older person, especially a person with metabolic syndrome, they're overweight, they have diabetes, and you know, unfortunately in New Zealand, uh, two thirds, actually more like 70% of the population is overweight or obese. So this would be most people. Um, the, you'd want longer fasting protocols. So uh, you know, one meal a day or OMAD, uh, or even the occasional multi-day fast, a four-day fast, a five-day fast, just to get yourself back to metabolic health. And metabolic health would be when your body mass index is back in the 20 to 25 zone, you don't have pre-diabetes anymore, your blood pressure is normalized or close to it, and your cholesterol profile is, is good. And when I say a good cholesterol profile, I talk about the HDL and the triglycerides, not the LDL. It's because the HDL triglycerides are part of the metabolic syndrome, not the LDL. And I guess that is... Um, I think fasting, if there's one intervention in the medical system that we could actually introduce to do the most good for the most people in the world, it would just be to prescribe intermittent fasting protocols. Nothing else. It's that simple. Third thing, so mission fasting, third thing would be, yes, I'm sure almost everyone has said this, a low carb or ketogenic diet. That could be vegetarian or carnivore or omnivore. I do think uh, for most men who are trying to have good physical performance, carnivore has an advantage, but omnivore is absolutely fine. Um, there should be some meat in there. Vegetarian can still work. I've got patients on vegetarian keto. Uh, however, uh, I, I, I guess I would favor the other two over that slightly, but I'm not anti-vegetarian. And the important thing to realize about, realize about um, maybe not so much a low carb diet, but a ketogenic diet, it's not really a diet, it's more of a method for getting yourself in ketosis. And again, that is a state where your mitochondria have uh, increased ability to repair themselves and renew themselves. And you get mitophagy, uh, you know, the birth of new mitochondria, um, mitogenesis and mitophagy, the um, taking out of the old junky ones. So that's accentuated the most with a good fasting protocol, probably, but it's pretty good with the ketogenic diet. Fourth thing would be, uh, yes, I'm, I'm going to say sleep, but not just sleep, rest. So most guys don't know how to rest properly. They certainly don't know how to sleep properly. So 
Rest means taking yourself out and allowing your stress hormones to try and equilibrate a little bit. We're chronically stressed uh, in today's society. It's really important to fight that process as much as possible by trying, trying to restore balance. And um, that can just be like taking 10 minutes out and doing uh, something called a non-sleep deep rest protocol. There's a few of those on the internet, really good 10, 15 minutes of uh, basically body, body um, map meditation type stuff or breathing exercises, things like that, that actually have very uh, reasonably powerful physiological effects uh, and actually um, are good. And uh, rest is also extremely good in terms of uh, exercise. And um, I'll talk about exercise as my fifth one, but rest the rest periods is where your body actually improves. The exercise itself is damaging. It's the rest periods where you actually get stronger. So most uh, guys who are exercise fanatics exercise too much. And although they may be getting very fit with that approach, they're probably not, they may not be doing a very good uh, thing for their health. Uh, sleep, of course, you know, your non-REM and your REM sleep, crucial. Sleep is crucial. Why? Because you got to know why things are, are important before you do the how. Sleep is where the brain uh, builds itself. The memories are built and modified to adjust themselves to the day. It allows you to, um, especially REM sleep, allows you to adjust yourself to the emotional turmoil of the day and encounter those stressful situations better the next day with uh, less sort of uh, emotional um, um, seesawing and, uh, you know, more stability. And it's really important for a guy to have his emotions in check throughout the day when he's dealing with difficult interactions. You know, you can't let your emotions guide your decisions. So your sleep is, is really um, the foundation of that. If your sleep is poor, you're, you're going to have a very difficult time thinking properly and controlling your emotions. To do that, I think it's really critical to know how much sleep one needs and then give oneself that sleep amount of sleep time every night. So if you need nine hours, you need to give yourself nine hours of sleep time and don't, don't cut into that with anything else. There's really nothing else. Um, fasting won't cut into it because you fast when you sleep and you know your meals should be eaten, uh, your keto or low carb meals should be eaten well before bedtime. And uh, so, you know, maybe you're up late working on your mission. That would be acceptable, I suppose, sometimes. But sleep, really giving yourself that sleep opportunity is important. Try not to use an alarm clock. Young guys need to sleep more in the morning. It's okay to sleep in. And uh, really, I think we do a disservice to, uh, to young men, by force, especially teenagers, to force them to get up really early because they need their um, morning sleep. That's where more of your REM sleep is. And uh, again, it, it comes down to that uh, modifying the brain and, and building in emotional stability. So sleep and rest. And the fifth thing would be exercise. I would say though for exercise, I bet you I have a different approach from uh, a lot of the other guys. I favor, I don't think if one is going for functional strength, okay? So if you're going for powerlifting or competition, this does not apply. But if you're going for functional strength, it also complements health. So optimize mitochondria function. You do not want to exercise for more than an hour a week and ideally half an hour. So that this is, uh, this is my uh, own practice and I definitely see the best results of this. So I will do three uh, very intense uh, sessions a week. They will last anywhere from seven to 10 minutes. So 25 minutes a week on average. And uh, they will be straight first thing in the morning. First of all, that's a fantastic antidepressant. If you start with a very high intense exercise regimen and you just do it no matter how you feel even if you don't feel like doing it you just do it uh it's just fantastic for the rest of your day so there's the mental benefits but also of course the physical ones so first of all you're doing this uh exercise which is really damaging it releases a lot of free radicals into your system and uh, those free radicals reactive oxygen species are damaging but you do it for five to 10 minutes and then you have this huge rest period because I'm not gonna do the next one for 48 hours and um, where you can repair and, and rest properly and sleep and hydrate and all these things. So um, that to me is really important doing a very um, short but high intensity workout. I do not think weights are necessary either except for maybe a pair of barbells. So, uh, the exercises I definitely favor and almost exclusively do are body weight exercises. So you can do very intense, difficult exercises with body weight. You can do handstand pushups. You can do L sits. You can do pistol squats. These are things that the vast majority of men are unable to do. And I mean the vast majority because they're very hard and it's far more effective than going to the gym, lifting weights, 
improperly on your text, talking to people because there's other people at the gym wasting your time. You can do these things with no rest. Like when I do the, the you know, sort of seven to 10 minutes, there is no rest. There might be 15 second breaks between each session, but sometimes there's none. If you do that, you're going to get a, just an unreal workout. And it's body weight only. It's, it's really good on the joints because you're not lifting, you know, uh, 200 kilograms or, you know, whatever it is, the exercise, it depends on the exercise, of course, how much you can lift, but it's very good on your joints. And that is very good for long-term health. And uh, just the whole short high intensity aspect of it keeps you very functionally strong. And it also, uh, you know, if you do that in a fasted state as well, and, and you don't eat for a few hours afterwards, you're going to accentuate your fasting too. So those are my top five things. I think that's enough. Mission, fasting, low carb or ketogenic diet, uh, rest and sleep, and finally, um, high intensity exercise with long periods of rest in between. And that is for health. That is, again, that would not necessarily be for someone who wants to be extremely fit uh, or skillful at some, some endeavor. So, uh, yes, I did say I don't eat much. I should correct that. I don't eat frequently, but when I do eat, I eat, I eat one meal a day. I'm an OMAD guy. So I will eat a very big meal, like sort of 5,000 calorie meal, but it's only once a day. So I don't eat much time-wise. And um, I, I find that works for uh, very well for health, but also for time efficiency. And uh, as you know, we were talking about my department here, uh, you know, half the neurology department is down with COVID-19 at the moment. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've yet, you know, I haven't had any sort of symptoms or illnesses. I haven't had any illnesses for, for years, to be honest. I never get the flu or any of these things. So I don't know. Uh, I like to think that the fasting ketogenic diet protocols and everything else are protecting me from, from these viruses. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I meant by that. I don't eat frequently, but I do eat quite a bit. My last question here has been asked about uh, health in women. Now, that is an interesting because I do my my list of top five would vary to an extent with with women. So that was for men, not for women. Um, and I don't have time to say my top five for women, so I'm not going to do it. And, and this is for men's health after all. But I, uh, in terms of intermittent fasting, I I would still rank that very highly for women as well. I know there are. are um, uh, differences in in how the body uh, metabolizes between men and women. Uh, for example, women can get much higher ketone levels in general than men. They seem to have greater access to their body fat reserves. And um, uh, some people have questioned uh, whether it is a, even as useful for women uh, compared to men. Um, I would say that it is very useful for both women and men to have an intermittent fasting regimen, uh, but your, your goals might be slightly different. Uh, but I would say they're both very important. So men and women uh, can do, could do the fast together. A husband and wife, like a couple, could do the fasting together. I think that's ideal. And then uh, you eat once or twice a day. And when you do it, you just enjoy it. And it's, it probably creates a more of a, a better social atmosphere, um, relationship atmosphere as well. But I, I do think it's just as important for women. Just they metabolize things a little differently. Final words of wisdom. Uh, okay, so guys, you're like a ship on the ocean. Ocean is life. You're the captain of the ship. There's a lot of stuff that's going to come along and try to capsize you. Okay, not just uh, uh, destructive behaviors and unhealthy habits, but bad people and so on. Sometimes the ocean's really calm and the sailing is smooth, but sometimes there's storms. And it's critical not to lose your head, not to get emotional, and just stay focused on your mission, whatever that is. Health is just a mechanism to achieve your mission. So no matter what you think about health, um, just being the uh, healthiest guy on the planet is not enough. You've got to have a reason for that. So that I, I guess that mission really is important. Why are you here on this planet? And that uh, will bring a whole host of benefits to your life. <laughs>